Hello, my name is Sam Felton and welcome to Expert Interviews here on Smash the Fat. For you today we've got another fantastic interview um, from broadcaster and independent researcher as well, Charles C.J. Hunt. How's it going, C.J.? It's great, Sam. How are you? I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. It's literally, because we were just talking about the weather just before we came on the air, and it's literally just started tipping it down. And as we say over here, it's raining cats and dogs, literally. Um, but the weather's meant to be getting better. Um, yeah. But, you know, I'm inside, and we're chatting, so it's all good. Um, and you're over in Santa Fe, is that Santa, right? Santa Fe, New Mexico. Yeah. And, and I've only been here about six months, so it's quite an adventure. And it's beautiful, you know, the, it's, yeah. it's right on the foothill you know, on the edge of the foothills of the mountains here, and Taos is not far away, and and uh, it's it's the original, um, the very first, I think, uh, capital in the United States is Santa Fe. But anyway, it's got a long history. Yeah. It's got a long history, and it's really interesting because there's still a lot of adobe here, and it's, you know, like being in the southwest of America, if yeah. anyone wants to look that up. Absolutely, and, and then you've, you've always got the chance of meeting George R. R. Martin there, as well, I believe that's where he resides. Yes, he does. In fact, where I get my hair cut, he owns that whole block, wow. <laughs> including the little theater. He's got a little theater there he owns, and yes, he's a popular local fellow. Yeah, I bet, I bet. Fantastic. No. Um, but you are also going to be a, a popular local fellow, um, because uh, you made the documentary The Perfect Human Dyer, which is a fantastic documentary that I highly recommend everybody going to watch. Um, now that was back in, I think, was it 2010? That, that yeah. was well. It was actually released in 20 December 2012. So, and it really started taking off yes. January 2013. And quite unexpectedly, it went to number one in. The United States and Canada for about a week. It. Uh, I'm not sure if it hit number one. I know it got top ten in the UK, and, and which I thought was amazing because you know here I'm. I'm just a filmmaker. I'm not a, a networker like you and Rob Wolf and you know Mark Sisson and people like that. But luckily, you know they mentioned it and it took off like wildfire and people are are really. I'm happy with it, which is was the whole intention, and now it's all over the world and subtitled in twelve languages, you know. Fantastic. So, oh yeah, just recently Chinese and Thailand. Oh, wow, you know, oh, Thailand. great! So get, get getting into the east as well. That's fantastic. Uh, I know it, it's pretty pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and now um, we have a treat because it's a couple of years later after um, human diet book is now out to accompany the documentary. Um, and that's really what we're going to be talking about today, the book specifically, um, kind of what else it gives you on top of the documentary um, and, and why you'd want to, to buy the book as well as the documentary. Um, but before we get into all of that jazz, um, you've actually had quite an interesting journey in how you got into health and nutrition. So let's talk a little bit about that first. Well, it all started really in 1978. I was uh, 24 years old. I was a motocross racer, dirt bike racer, and um, which I think is still popular in the UK. And I, that's like an off-road <laughs> steeplechase on motorcycles. And yeah, I was out. To, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. And now we have Supercross, which yeah. is the indoor version, right in in football mm -hmm. stadiums. But uh, I was having a great time with that. I wanted to be a you know world class athlete. And I went out jogging one day at Beverly Hills High School and dropped dead of a cardiac arrest on Memorial Day, 1978. So. <laughs> Luckily, there was an anesthesiologist who showed up a couple of minutes later to go jogging because it was a holiday. No one was on the schoolyard. And uh, he got to me and gave me CPR and kept me going until the paramedics got there. They took me to UCLA Medical Center, which is a famous medical center in West Los Angeles. And, um, you know, after they had jump started me on the field, and then they, you know, I spent 10 days in intensive care. And that was a real wake up call to wanting to find out how to take care of myself. So that was really the initiation of the journey into health and wellness. And then, 
you know, over the years, I tried everything. I was a raw food vegan for five years. I did fasting. I did macrobiotics. It, you know, it was long before paleo existed. Mm -hmm. You know, no one knew about that. The word didn't was never used. And um, uh, all the low carb diets had come out. You know, like Atkins and things like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, primarily, I you know, you know, we didn't have the internet. I went down to the lo local metaphysical bookstore and started you know reading the health books from the wackos that had written health books, right? Because it was yeah. not not popular uh, at, at the time like it is now. But that's how it really started. And then ultimately, I got into broadcasting and news and saw that. Um, I had always had this deep interest in health and wellness, and when I saw the obesity epidemic getting worse and worse and worse, and people kept telling us the same things, and but it, it wasn't getting any better, I said, well, where else can we look? And that started the genesis to, you know, going back to school and learning how to make films and ultimately making the movie, or, you know, the documentary. So that's kind of the short, the Cliff Notes version of, of how I got into that. Yeah. Um, and how, how did you come across kind of paleo and things like that? Well, initially, Dr. Michael uh, Mike Eads, who wrote Protein Power, had yeah. a small paragraph in his original book about that the whole low carb principles really came from this uh, from evolution. And he talked about Paleolithic nutrition a little bit, and he talked about uh, a place in Pennsylvania in the United States uh, called the Hoonan Dig, where the the indigenous people, when they were hunters, were really healthy when they dug up the bones, right? And then 300 years later, when they were farmers, they went to hell in a handbasket, as they would say over here. You know, they, they had yeah. all the you know changes in their bone structure, you know, dropping height, weak and brittle bone weak and brittle bones, you know, rotting around the orbits of the eyes, you know, dental caries, all that kind of stuff. So that's where I first saw that. And then later I saw there was a newspaper article out of uh, Dallas talking about Lauren Cordain long before he was willing to be an author. <laughs> and he, he talked a little bit about that too. So um, that's where I first heard about that. And, uh, you know, and then that's when I started looking around and saying, well, what more can I learn? you know about this idea and of I eventually I came out with an earlier work called diet evolution and uh, that's was based on interviews with uh, Cordain and um, Dr. Eads basically you know and then like you at that time I was young and into fitness and so that has a little you know exercise section and you know much like your uh, slimology idea just that kind of uh, wanting to help people yeah. get that basic information out that's fantastic. And I see, I have, I'm have. i going to prove it to you. There it is, <laughs> yeah. right there. <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. It's fantastic um, that, 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 you've, uh, that you're going to be reading it. It's great, CJ. Um, because, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I, did, I did get the documentary when it first came out. I thought, what a fantastic piece of television, um, of filmmaking even, um, to to put this all in perspective, because this is this is what it, what the almost the crux of um, paleo principles is is that it's all about perspective, um, and you have a great analogy to put the, the the this massive timeline in perspective. So tell us about that, Griffin. Oh, the the football field timeline. Yeah. Yeah. I had seen a television show with Lauren Cordain before his books came out, and he had taken a big piece of computer paper and unrolled it all through a library for CBS, and it showed that this timeline, he was trying to represent and give people an idea of, well, how long is the Paleolithic, you know, who showed up where along that timeline? What were the dietary changes that happened in this timeline? And I said, well, that's really interesting, but pe most people don't really get that idea if they're looking at a piece of paper rolled out on the floor. So it made sense to find a scale and something that everyone would pretty much would recognize. So we mapped it out onto a football field. And then, as, as you know, in the movie, we walked down the football field and we talked about you know, Homo erectus and all the different changes and where the dietary changes happen as we move through time down the football field until we get to the very end. Because I think people are really, 
you know, when they watch the documentary, that that I th it really makes the point when you get down to the last half yard of this long hundred yard football field, oh, yeah. and and that's the first time agriculture shows up, and then you get down to the last blade of grass before the goal line, you know, the last one fifth of one inch, and that's industrial foods and junk foods and all that kind of stuff and you turn around and you look back down the football field and that's you know like Lawrence says that's a long way you yeah. know and all this other time we were eating wild animals and wild plant foods you know that we weren't eating dairy we weren't eating grains you know and as soon as we did that of course there were all sorts of negative effects so um, yeah thank you I, I think that it, it's a good illustration and actually yeah. where I've gotten a ton of positive feedback and say, go, ah, the light bulb goes off. Is that they can finally see it as far as the timeline is concerned. Because two and a half million years, you know, how do you visualize that? Yes. And then and then of course the in the film and in the book, it's the continuation of that journey and understanding because I think it's probably true for you too, is that when you understand the principles and the why behind what you're doing, mm -hmm. then you're able to, you, it's empowering and you're able to make your own decisions because you understand the, the principles and then you, it's also something that then makes it easier to live out throughout your whole life because otherwise if you're following a guru and you're just following a recipe that someone gave you, after a while you get frustrated or tired and you say, you know, I don't want to weigh, count, and measure anymore, you know, and you'll abandon it and of course that doesn't do you any good. So I think you're right that it's when I wanted people to to go on the journey with me and see these places so they could see for themselves mm. what what uh, the discoveries were and there were a lot of discoveries I never expected you know inclu including the bioanalysis results at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig oh, yeah. Germany and then in the book of course because I couldn't you know in an hour and a half in a film you can't cover everything. Mm -hmm. And that one of the, one of the core elements of the book now, the companion book, is that I share the full interviews with the five top evolutionary health experts throughout the course of the film, all the anthropologists and whatnot, so that people really hear everything they had to say as far as you know the becoming human story. I call it now in the book is because people really don't even the paleo enthusiasts. I don't think they really fully grasp what that story is yes. and if I can make one quick leap I think I, I think the one of the biggest things the whole the paleo movement um, as it's become you know which a hundred different things now uh, I think what we miss is that it's two things one is that the paleolithic are three distinct periods and it's the becoming human story is the story of eating more and more animal products, more meat, mm -hmm. more the brains, the, the the marrow from the bones, and fewer plants. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, because our ancestors did that, more and more meat, more and more animal fats, pop, along comes Homo homo sapien, you and I, mo early modern humans. Now, early modern humans are in that last third called the Upper Paleolithic. And if there's a lower, middle, upper. Right. And um, it's what we were eating then that I think we all ought to look, take a closer look at it, when we're discussing, well, what is paleo? Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, um, and because those are the foods that created optimal health and wellness for our species when we were here. Not just all of our, you know, how, what did our ancestors eat two million years ago, and use that as an excuse to continue eating potatoes. You know, uh, it's, 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 you know, if you want, if we were still eating potatoes, we'd still be in the trees. So, um, as one of the, that's that's someone else said that to me. So no one has to get, no one has to get angry. The American Museum of Natural History said, "If we'd continued being, ed you know, you saw that. If yes, we continued yeah, being vegetarians, yeah. we likely wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah, you know, at, at the level at the level that we're communicating." There's so, a um, um, there's a really good documentary. I don't know if you've seen it by the BBC called "Walking with Cavemen," um, and it goes through the entire kind of evolution 
of man, like all of the um, kind of all of the different stages, uh, but also all of the uh, separations as well, because um, we we weren't the only um, uh, hominids at the time. There were like 22 species, I think you mentioned. Yeah, and they've now they found one or two more, so there might be a, a couple more in there. Uh, they're still verifying all that, but that there are um, were. Tw- According to the American Museum of Natural History, when I spoke with them, they said there were 22 distinct versions, and we're the only survivor. Mm-hmm. We're, we're the last. <laughs> so ho- hopefully we won't be the last, you know, <laughs> yes, you know that, that we'll learn something and not ruin our home. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's part of the thing that's fascinating, and many of these hominid groups were living on the planet together at the same time. But when we showed up, because of our uh, ability to adapt and our bigger brains, and that we were really able to exploit the environment better than anybody else, you know, and that's, you know, another reason why you don't have Neanderthals in Northern Europe anymore, you know, it's yeah. because we were better at using the environment and we you know, and then there's debate on. <laughs> well, yeah. Then there's I, I, debate on why why did they go away and why are we still here? You know, it could have been a it could have been a little uh, rough and tumble back then. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure there must have been some uh, some tribal wars for sure, <laughs> undoubtedly. Um, but uh, with with that intelligence that we've got, as you say, we're able to um, completely change the environment surrounding us, and part of that. Um, during the past kind of 30,000 years, we've been able to introduce agriculture to the environment. Um, and this has been a bit of a double-edged sword in terms of what it has actually done to society. Um, so, so, so tell us about that part of our, of our evolution. Well, or yeah, evolution. you're right. You're right. It's, it's um, as we spread around the globe... Um, you know, we moved out towards the east and, and into China, and what we now know as China, and, you know, Australia, and then we went into northern Europe. And we were really good at what we did. We were really good hunters. And um, in some areas, uh, we wiped them out pretty much, <laughs> you know. For, for So they, they um, expanded what they were able to do in order to create resources and that's you know of course grains and agriculture about 10 grand years ago 10,000 years ago um, is is where plant agriculture grain specifically uh, started but what I found was really interesting is that um, agriculture and the Neolithic which is right after the end of the paleo the upper Paleolithic where we showed up um, it took a while to take root in particularly in Europe and the United mm-hmm. Kingdom and stuff it did, that didn't really happen till 5000 years later there were a couple of waves that came up it didn't stick mm-hmm. you know and um, and then when it eventually did stick and one of the things i bring forward in the book now cuz you see i sat back and listened to all the interviews again right cuz like you and i are doing now you don't remember every little detail yeah. and as it turns out is that uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting and one of the, the secret about agriculture when people start making excuses for agriculture is when it first plant agriculture, let me be more specific, uh, when it first went into the UK, even when it did take root, people were not interested in plants. People were interested in these great little domesticated animals and apparently the fact that they could make cheese you know, in some of these containers, they think that the, the as a way of storing food and and yeah. and whatnot. Uh, but primarily, they were still interested in animal foods. And at those at that time, interestingly enough, their health it, it's not reflected in the um, agricultural record, which are the bones that are left behind. Uh, it's not reflected that their health was damaged initially, like it was by the people who became the grain eaters. Right. You know that didn't happen until later, when eventually more and more grains were uh, taken into the diet in the United Kingdom specifically. So I th- I think that's one of the things that's fascinating when you really learn from evolutionary history and adaptation is you guys, <laughs> you smart guys there in the UK, 
You didn't want the grains. You thought, hey, I don't have to go chase these animals around anymore. And of course, you know, cows back then, I forget the official name of the, the one. They were huge. Yeah, they were like two meters tall. and things. They were talking, you know, big horns, and it's not like the, the little wimpy domestic cows we have now. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the interesting things is people, wherever we could get it, our species, at, at, we wanted to eat um, medium and large herbivores. We preferred animal foods. Mm -hmm. It's only when that started running out that we had to then use our big brains at, for a survival strategies to uh, and find other things to exploit. That's where we expanded into seafoods and things mm -hmm. like that that the ne Neanderthals didn't do. So the thing is though, and, and just another little uh, distinction to understand about that is that when we expanded our diet and started eating more plant foods more often is that this was a survival strategy. It's not a thriving strategy. Yeah. You know, it was it was not optimal for our for the human species and you know, to the chagrin of some, it's still not. <laughs> so <laughs> so it's 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 worth understanding more about our becoming human story and and really take that in when you're when you're looking at what you're doing today. Yeah, absolutely. Um and um just going going back to the book, um because I wanted to show everybody like the way that you've laid it out. Um, oh, thank it's, you. Because it's, it's laid out really well. Um, just like the documentary explains it in a nice flowing way. You can't believe that kind of, you know, an hour and 20 minutes has gone um, afterwards. Uh, but just so everybody can see, you know, you've split it up primarily into just three sections. Um, part one, the truth. Part two, the science. Um, and part three, the how-to. Um, and um, it's, it's so important that you've kind of laid it out in that way so that people understand, um, understand you know, the reality of the situation um, and then the science in terms of putting it into perspective, why you'd want to be going down this route as well and why it's so important to kind of come at it from this evolutionary biological um, perspective. Um, and then finally, obviously, the how-to. As well, and 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 during during that, I think is it Mike Richards, the um, the researcher, is it Mike at Richards? the Max Planck Institute? Yeah, yeah, and he he he's you asked him in the documentary, and you put it in the book as well, um, whether or not there were any vegan or vegetarian um, people kind of before agriculture and things, and and what did he say? Well, he. He, he said no. In fact, that you know, I don't remember the exact quote off that. I'd have to open the book real quick, right? <laughs> but, but but essentially, is that it's uh, impossible. Yeah. You know, that, is that that we could not have survived as vegetarians, and uh, you know, the world didn't support that. The, you know, we're coming out of an ice age. It's like Lauren talks about in the movie. You know, above forty degrees north latitude, there are very few plants, if any. Um, the the bioanalysis of the bones. All over the world show that modern humans, you know, wanted to eat meat and animal foods and very little plants. And um, I think that's one of the things that was really interesting. Is yeah, he says yeah, no modern vegans in, until recently. And now, it, because people are doing that, it's an experiment. It's another evolutionary experiment. Mm -hmm. So and, and, that, and, that, and that's something that you actually do in the documentary. I'm not sure if you mentioned it in. In the book, I mean, you mentioned all of that, but you actually go to like a ve vegetarian and vegan conference and, right. and, and interview some of the people there about, you know, their perspective on things, and they're sort of saying that, oh, actually, we've got a vegetarian's GI tract and stuff like this, and then it's like. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I lived in San Francisco at the time because I was finishing school uh, at San Francisco State, and it just so happened when I was getting ready to go to to Europe and you know do the interviews over there that there was a, a world international world vegetarian conference. So I went and chatted with them. You know, I thought it was why not hear what they had to say from the horse's mouth, as they Absolutely. would say. You know, and but I think it's it's revelatory. I mean, it's not in. in in this particular movie, there was even a vegan dog. 
Speaking dog food. Dog food company there. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I don't know what to say. So, um, but thank you for, for sharing that li about the book because I wanted people to understand why I became an advocate and I'm not just a reporter anymore. In the film, I was yeah. it's the reporter, you know, just looking for the answers and just holding them out and saying, hey, you know, these isn't this interesting? Isn't this fascinating? And and there's something there that we ought to pay attention to and it ought to be part of the conversation at minimum, uh, even in the political circles about what is going to make us healthy and solve obesity and diet-related chronic disease. But then, you know, people would write in and say, uh, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> so, and I, and they kept doing that. And eventually, I, uh, I went out and I had some um, screenings around the country. And the thing that the tipping point for me uh, was event, meeting this one older woman who I met in the small Missouri town uh, where she had just seen the film. And she and her husband had traveled over a hundred miles, four counties, as they would say, to see the film. And yeah. she said, "This gives me hope." You know, I, I just it gives me hope that I can feel better, and that was really it. On top of all these other requests coming in, saying, "Okay, well, we better get on the ball and and provide more resources," you know, for people. So that's why there's the how-to, and then also I didn't want a how-to based on my opinion or based on um, peer pressure, as so unfortunately so many do, um, mm -hmm. and. So I went to the, the doctor from the film, Lane Sebring, who was the very first practicing uh, practicing physician in the United States over 15 years ago to start using these evolutionary health principles. And so no one has more experience than he does with his patient population. And so that's where the guidelines from the how-to come from. So it's not just something I made up and thought, okay, this will stick, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, and threw it up against the wall, you know, oh, this sounds good. Let me just throw that in there. So that's all based on on his patient population and experience in my interviews with him uh, in for the film and then subsequent ones while preparing the book. But yeah, I think the core of it is that the book is set up to do something different. It's instead of being a prescription, it, there's a, a way of learning I learned in school. It's called um, solutions by understanding. And the things that stick with us are, are those, in fact, if you really want to solve, if you have some issue with your health, your fitness, your wellness, that, and you want to be healthy long term, you really do need to understand. And uh, nicely enough, this story is interesting. <laughs> you know, and, and, and um, it, like the film is an easy watch and the book is an easy read, you know, the, because it's compelling when you when you start moving through this arc of becoming human because you it, I think it makes you want to know more about yourself you know and where and where you came from and then then once you understand that then when you're presented with a how-to you go oh well okay I get it now I know why there's human foods and non-human foods <laughs> can't get any simpler than that right Here's the, here's the list that we're adapted to and that have been proven in the doctor's practice. And here's a list that, well, it's not going to serve you very well if you want to keep eating that. you know. Uh, and I'm not telling anyone to do. I'm just showing them that here's what they can do or could do yeah. and that it could you know, bring them, as, like I say on the subtitle here, I'll do, a, I'll do a commercial, for the health and life you deserve. You know? And I think that's... Mm -hmm my perspective and that's what also why I call it the human diet not a paleo diet or anything like that because it is different than what modern paleo has become um, it's I try to stick you know and I do I stick to the science and what the experts have shared with me and then the doctor proven version of that does that make sense yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, very much so, CJ. Yeah, I'm going to stick to what the doctor's saying and um, that he uses in his practice. And it's Lee, uh, Lee Sebring, was it? Uh, Lane. Lane. Lane, sorry. Lane. That's okay. Well, um, and that, that's the thing, too, is that he's in a small town in Texas, and he's really hard to get to, and now, because he's... A, he's so good, he's really expensive. So here's here's a way for people to to learn what they would learn if they went there and spent, you know, three thousand dollars for a workup. You know, they can at least yeah. understand 
uh, what he brings out of his practice and 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 then you know I also share why I think that's a really great idea so and again like with the anthropologists that are shared in the book I share the longer interviews with uh, Dr. Sebring as well so that people once again, so that people really understand, well, when we say human foods and non-human foods, it becomes, oh, well, that's a no-brainer. You know, now now I get it. And then that makes it easy for people to make choices. That's right. And then go, go, go to the supermarket and actually navigate the supermarket in kind of an efficient way. Um, because you, you do a great trip around the supermarket in the film, and you've got some great shopping tips in the book. Um, and it's kind of, you know, really mostly avoid the inside, just go around the outside and there might be one aisle that you'll have to go down to get to the nuts or something like that, you know. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just literally the meat and poultry aisle, the vegetable fruit aisle, some frozen veg as well. Um, and that's kind of about it, really. Um, and um, I think uh, Dr. Sebring um, gave a bit of an example there. And I've heard this from many other people as well as when they start to adopt this way of life, their shopping trips actually become shorter as well. Yeah, they do, because you're not kind of wandering around being, you know, <laughs> chasing all the pretty little colors that they put on the packaging and, you know, and, yeah. and, and following your, you know, the little, the little devil sitting on your shoulder or your four-year-old kid that goes, oh, I want that. Yeah, it makes it really quick and simple, I think. That's true. And, and it's so funny. In fact, yesterday... I was at the supermarket at uh, the local Whole Foods here, and there was a woman, and she, she must have been having a barbecue. She had at least six or ten packages. I, and I wanted to take a picture, but I didn't have permission. So she had like six <laughs> or ten packages of, of of ground meat, and you know all these all these animal foods. And it, but it was stacked high. It was kind of funny, because oh. literally her whole her whole basket was was full of that and a few leafy greens and stuff like that. And so oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just like, well, I guess she's somewhere along the line. She's either got a barbecue or she understands. So. Yeah. So that that's gathering, gathering the hunted, you could say. Oh yes, yes. I mean, if I was out doing the new film, I'd be doing that. Oh, by you just make me think because of the Dr. Seabird thing, in 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 the book, and I still have to look it up myself. Is it, I'm gonna I'm gonna set up a free membership thingy, and I'm still learning the online tech part of it, and I'm gonna put up um, the rest of the store tour. They didn't make it into the documentary. Oh, cool. And and some of the other uh, patient interviews and things like that. Uh, you know, and also working on setting up a uh, for people to do it before October one when it officially launches. Hey, forgive me, I'm still learning how to whether people have to send me their receipts or what. We'll put that up and we get it figured out. Maybe you can tell me after this. But um, uh, we're gonna set up a special hangout like this. A private hangout or, uh, or a private Skype or something like that for people who bought the book to do a Q and A with Dr. Sebring. It was something that they couldn't, couldn't, couldn't normally do. So, so uh, you, there you go, there you go, there you have it. That's awesome. It's kind of my short, my short, short commercial there. Well, because I'm still trying to learn how to start, you know, to bring more information out and share that with people in a way that it, you know helps them uh, implement these ideas. Fantastic, um, and a, and a surefire way to do that is to buy the book, The Perfect Human Diet, which is available on the 1st of October worldwide, I believe. Yeah, it is. It, it, that's one of the nice things about Amazon, yeah. and the, the publishers, because of the new kinds of publishing that are available, they can, they can print one book, they can print a thousand books, and uh, nicely enough, that makes it so that it's available you know, all over the world, and if you have um, friends, uh, people that are in the UK that are listening, if you really, it would be a, a great uh, boost, of course, as always, if you if you like the book or whatever you think about the book, if you'll go put a, a review up, and I don't think they let you do it until the first day it's officially released, um, but in the United States, if by chance we're lucky enough to make one of the bestseller lists, is that I think that would be cool, not because for selling the book, but because it would bring these ideas to a much larger audience. And as as 
the title of the book says, it's the how-to companion to the film. And a lot of people would get to see the film that had never seen it. So, I mean, that's one of our USA goals is like, well, but then again, here I am, a filmmaker and not Rob Wolf. Mm -hmm. So, so, so we need we're to get the word out. Mark Sisson, yes. Yeah, so anything we can do to get the word out would be lovely. That's right. You know, and, and very much appreciated. Absolutely. So. And, and, and people can pre-order the book um, via Amazon if they go to smashthefat.com forward slash TPHDUS if you're in the US and then TPHDUK if you're in the UK and then you can pre-order from your uh, respective Amazon website. Yes, uh, I saw there. that on your site, Sam. That's very kind of you. I appreciate that. Makes oh, it really no easy for people. Oh, absolutely. Direct link and um, also helps support the show at the same time. Oh, that's um, right, because you'll get a little, a little. Yeah, yeah, because you get a little bit of a kickback, um, and yeah, nothing, nothing major. Just, just a little coal on the fire, as uh, my friend Vinny Tortoreach says, who's over in California. That's right. Keep <laughs> the lights on. Podcast. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, and uh, and people can also check out all the resources and things on your website, um, CJHuntReports.com. Right. Yeah. Um, when I decided to become more of an advocate, I started a blog. You know, not as <laughs> I'm not on there every day like you are, uh, mm -hmm. but I, to continue to share these ideas. And it's at CJ Hunt Reports, and there's stuff about the book there, there's stuff about the movie there, and there's stuff about events and you know upcoming appearances and you know all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, CJHuntReports.com is the new home of the perfect human diet. Awesome, and then people will be able to find you via Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Google Plus as well, I believe. Although you're still you're, you're still relatively new to Google Plus, although I think everybody is. So I wouldn't worry. Yeah, I mean, sh shockingly, I'm still learning how to use my iPhone. So <laughs> yeah, you know, when you're, I, I understand all the tech behind the filmmaking now. Now now to learn this has all changed so fast. The things that yeah. you know everyone has available to them now, it takes time to get through the learning curve. Yeah. You know. You know, at least, you know, when you're in your 60s. <laughs> <laughs> if I was still I'll 24, see. my God, that'd be great. <laughs> I'd, I'd still say that you're you're ahead of the curve, CJ, so, so I wouldn't put yourself down too much, mate. Um, and um, I'll tell you what, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today, CJ. It's been an honor as well, because I think the documentary is fantastic. The book is fantastic and what a cover as well this nice silver fork with a big slab of beef is, is it is it is it beef steak or or is it bison or something well actually the France and I'm assuming it looks like beef steak but yeah. I mean it could be buffalo or something else I don't know but but yeah thank you so much Sam I've been a follower of your work I've, I've been signed up to your newsletter for quite some time and and then when this was coming out it was very kind of you to say yeah send me a copy you know I'll check it out, and um, because I was very interested, and I am very interested in how people who this is their life's work think mm -hmm. what they think about this. You know, now that it's come out, and it was kind of you to invite me on. You know, I really appreciate that. Absolute pleasure. Um, everybody, go pre-order the Perfect Human Diet book on Amazon again. Smashthefat.com forward slash tphdus or tphdu. Okay. Um, and then go check out um, CJ's website and blog at cjhuntreports.com as well. Um, and was there any anywhere else where you wanted to point people to at all, CJ? Oh, no. Every, everything is kind of on the CJ Hunt Report site. And um, uh, again, if they're, if, you know, it's on LinkedIn and all that. Uh, and Facebook, it's Facebook Perfect Human Diet. It's not CJ Hunt Reports because that's you know how they are. <laughs> Once you're established, if you change anything, everyone goes away. You know, it, you start over from scratch. Um, but uh, all of that stuff is available through the website, and of course, you know, they've got all the little icons down there that'll take you to the LinkedIn or Facebook or that kind of thing to, you know, simple, simple, easy way to access those things without having to memorize <laughs> forward slash. That's right. well, uh, slash which, one, which, which one is this? Is it Hunt Thompson Media? Is it CJN Reports? You know, try not to create confusion. That's right. That's right. So, so, yeah. 
I mean, that, that leaves us only with one more thing to do, um, and that's to hear a smash it out, which is what we do at the end of every single interview with every single person, apart from the last one, actually. I totally forgot. Um, so on the count of three, I want you to shout smash it out to the camera. Okay. Cool. So one, two, three. Smash it out. Yes. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you so much, CJ. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and then, uh, hopefully we'll get you on again at some point soon. Well, thank you so much. And if you want the old SeaWorld version, it would be, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time to smash it out. Oh, that is wonderful. That's kind of like, um, what, what, what was the, um, the guy's name? Um, was it Casey... Oh, 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 the uh, the Casey Kaysen, the yes, uh, that's the one like that. The radio it. guy. You've got, you've got, yeah, you've got such a good radio voice. Obviously, you're a broadcaster. That's what you used to do. But well, yeah, that's uh, how it started. <laughs> that's right. It's fantastic, CJ. Absolutely fantastic. Um, and uh, again, we'll, we'll get you on again at some point. It's been fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Sam. That would be great. There are a, a lot of other little things I think that would interest you and your audience, and and we can follow up on that. That'd be great. Absolutely. All right, buddy. Take care. See Thank you, you. You too. Thanks, Sam.